In today's show, I'm receiving Art LePinch, the creator of the climate tech newsletter called Delphi Zero and a super inspiring mind. We talk about why climate tech has a huge story problem, how we can learn from other mega entertainment successes like F1, Drive to Survive, the MMA or UFC, why climate tech is the greatest game and most people haven't realized it yet, the use of Gen AI to inspire masses and the role of art to crack the climate fight. Welcome to this wide ranging conversation with Art Lapinch. Art, welcome to Climate Insiders. John, thank you so much. I'm super pumped to have you because we've had a number of conversations offline, conferences. We, we are creators as well. And uh, you're one of the top thinkers, I believe, in Europe. So it's really an honor to have you. Well, what an introduction. Yeah, also really looking forward to this conversation. And how would your best friend finish the sentence, Art Lapinch is? crazy uh, yeah i don't know <laughs> so most of my friends would say i have an amazing life life balance because i am not working in an office for many many years already but the truth is i think a little bit more nuanced than that so yeah started as a founder myself uh, previously in the advertising industry so i think we share the same background and that we worked in recruitment marketing 10 10 years ago or so and uh through a couple of different steps after starting my own business, luckily getting acquired, doing a sabbatical, I ended up in climate. So now spending most of my time writing about climate and exploring things on the intersection of energy, climate, and national security. Nice. Well, we're definitely going to go to that. Why those particular areas in particular? But um, first of all, as a way of introducing yourself, you're the brain and writer behind Delphi Zero. It's a newsletter. Could you just describe what it is and yeah, how the genesis of all this. Sure. Yeah, Delphi Zero was more of a side project that started a little over a year ago. And that was right around the time when I decided that I wanted to spend probably at least a decade and more of my time in climate. So the best way I learn is through reading. And my favorite type of writing is Tim Urban's Wait But Why blog. So mm. anything that is long form goes into detail and explores things holistically so full width and full depth is uh, my favorite and when when i when i tried to learn and try to find pieces of writing like this i didn't really find anything most of the stuff was either too technical and unfortunately i don't have a technical educational background so flies over my head then the other type of content you would get is ipcc reports which are from my perspective, very, very abstract and not really that tangible. Very dry. Super dry. And if you if you read passages of them, like you have to reread the sentences two or three times until you really get it. And then for the rest of us, it felt like there was only Extinction Rebellion. So I wanted to write the content that I would have liked to read myself. And so this is how the newsletter started. And I wanted to double click on two events of your personal history. Number one, you say that you're a war refugee. I would mm -hmm. love to you to kind of tell us more there, and and also uh, a personal acquisition, which probably enabled you to do to go free with your creativity. Yeah, for sure. So chronologically, I was uh, born in the Soviet Union, so which is currently Russia, a small town in Siberia called Tomsk. And my parents emigrated when I was six months old. And the, the chosen destination was Yugoslavia. So that was uh, pre-Civil War in Yugoslavia. So my dad worked there two years as a musician. And unfortunately, history unfolded and uh, we had to flee the conflict so we're living in a town called mostar and through i would say a lot of luck and a lot of hustle from my parents we eventually made it out initially to belgrade and then uh, we ended up in vienna so this is where i grew up and i would say definitely mo the, the most defining event of my life i don't really have that many memories from back then because i was two years old but there is one very vivid memory which was uh, I was tiny and we were running on an airfield strip and I had a tiny little umbrella in my hand and I dropped the umbrella and uh, I wanted to run back to get it but my mom mm, picked wow. me up and we ran towards the military cargo machine and it was the plane that eventually took us out of the conflict zone and 
after that, I don't remember anything. My mom was saying that the the situation was super tense, uh, bombs going off left and right while, while the plane was flying. And a week after that, the airstrip was bombarded. And so the air routes was closed. So incredibly, incredibly lucky getting out of there. And so, yeah, this is wow. uh, definitely yeah. an important part of our family history. Have you been back, uh, by the way? No, I have not been back. Yeah, you should. Uh, Sarajevo in particular is a beautiful city. I have I've a heard. Lot of friends now. So yeah, I've, I mean, beautiful people and such a shame that this region was engulfed in war. But um, yeah, definitely will make it uh, make it a point to going down there. But that served as a foundation for grit and determination. And that probably served you well in this entrepreneurial journey of yours. And so you had one exit, maybe kind of tell us more and and why that has been kind of the foundation for freeing you to and enabling you to do all sorts of things. Yeah, yeah, for sure. So uh, in university, initially, I wanted to go down the path of consulting just because everyone was doing it. And so it was type of herd mentality from my mm -hmm. from my side. I applied at ADL. It, they immediately rejected me. And so I said, oh, if they don't want to have it, <laughs> I'll try maybe something <laughs> else. And so then I started working for one of the institutes at my university. It was pretty much just setting up tables once a week, putting up pizza and Coca-Cola bottles for one entrepreneurs so former alumni would come back to school and talk to students and i really found that super inspiring to see people who really didn't hate their lives and didn't hate their jobs and uh caught the bug applied eventually to one of the entrepreneurs that was visiting and uh yeah i mean the rest of the path that set me up to become a venture developer for a german venture studio moved for them to the US, uh, starting advertising technology and fintech companies. And um, after that, just wanted to see what founding a business outside of a venture studio environment would be like if we could do it. So I got lucky to find a group of really great co-founders, which then eventually became really close friends of mine. And we decided to start a programmatic advertising platform It was particularly in the recruitment space and the way we saw it. And I would be curious to hear like what your experience was back in Symphony. So we saw is everywhere in the street, you would see these storefronts that had these uh, open, open for work and just like talent wanted signs hanging mm -hmm. out there. And at the uh, on the other side, we would see that most companies would recruit by Craigslist. And so Craigslist being a 1990s tech, we thought, or we were naive enough to think, oh, there's probably a better way of doing this. So we had our first idea to create Tinder for blue collar jobs. So imagine yeah. just like an app where you swipe left and right, have your job recommendations uh, in the vicinity. And the target market would have been mom and pop shops, restaurants, and small, medium sized businesses. We learned the hard way that this is a horrible horrible business area to be in because the sales cycles are super long uh, restaurant owners are super busy don't want to learn new software mm -hmm. and usually if something works for them which craigslist did then they didn't want to switch to a new solution um, but luckily there was a very different audience which were these on-demand marketplace companies like uber and lyft who had a very similar problem and they were interested in one particular feature of our solution which was the job distribution aspect, got lucky, timing was right. And we managed to, to recruit a lot of drivers for these companies, then branched out into trucking and other industry ver verticals and awesome. got acquired luckily before COVID. Before COVID, so perfect timing. Perfect timing. And I got yeah. you and I, I, I can testify, this is a, a tough uh, field. I also had my uh, run in Silicon Valley, not as an entrepreneur. I joined a startup uh, when he was still young, trying to compete with LinkedIn using machine learning. It is a tough space. And I think climate tech is much more inspiring. Not that the uh, job matching doesn't need to be fixed, but it's you know a lot more rewarding to address some of the biggest problems. And so let's talk about this. Let's open the chapter of how do we fix the climate tech story problem. And I love one of your lines. So I'm I'm a reader of your newsletter, Delphi Zero. I love it. It's a uh, and you. one of the line uh, that you use uh, uh, you know to introduce this fundamental problem is all the ingredients are there for an epic human fight, the greatest adventure ever, the best story ever told, yet somehow you cannot rally the masses 
they know, but they don't feel. What does that mean to you? Oof, so many things. So, well, so let's start with the last sentence. They know, but they don't feel. Mm, most of the time, I have the impression um, it's it's not rational decision making that gets people into action. It's usually some sort of emotional resonance uh, that gets rationalized after the fact so even if people think oh yes of course it logically makes sense to do something most of the times it starts with an emotional response and it seems like this is one of the main struggles that the climate tech space or climate space overall currently has uh, absolutely and you dig even deeper into the the difference between knowledge and emotion and we need to build an emotional base and I think you're really good at storytelling because you use very practical cases. You know, when we talk about uh, uh, storytelling and inspiring the masses, you have one particular anchor example, which is the Formula One drive to survive moment. <laughs> yeah. So why, why is this so special? So as a European, you probably know 10, 15 years ago, uh, if you would uh, meet an American, they probably wouldn't know what a Formula One was. They would say NASCAR maybe or mm -hmm. yeah. something along these lines. But uh, fast forward to 2022, 2023, when people visit Europe, you, sometimes they wear Ferrari hats or McLaren hats. They tell you that Lewis Hamilton is their favorite driver or uh, Charles Leclerc. And uh, I asked myself, like, okay, where does this come from? Even people who usually are not interested in, let's say, cars and racing in general. So people who work as creative directors at a fashion advertising agency. So actually a friend of mine, he is really interested in Formula One. And so that was a really interesting question. Where does this come from? And there is research that shows that the Netflix show uh, F1 Drive to Survive had a massive impact in American audiences mm -hmm. to get them interested in the sport. And so the way I explain it in one of my essays was that you can think of attention on a spectrum between emotion and knowledge. So if you watch, for example, Formula One, on the one side of the spectrum, knowledge is like if you are a race driver, if you know how to calibrate, let's say, the front or the heck spoiler, what type of tire uh, combination actually has the best grip, what type of configuration of your engine makes you drive the fastest laps. So then you're full on on the knowledge side of the spectrum. And you see the sport at a very, very high fidelity. So you can really judge what are the race drivers doing. That is more kind of like an intellectualized viewing experience where like, oh, they did this. That's why they're faster. On the other side of the spectrum, you don't know any of the technical aspects, but you care about the story of Charles Leclerc of making it from a kid that used to mm -hmm. go to the go-kart driving circuits that made his steps up through Formula 3 and so on, got, got his first racing contract and eventually becomes one of the best drivers in the world uh, to race Formula 1. So this journey to glory is actually something that more people can resonate with than a spoiler adjustment, mm -hmm. right? And what uh, F1 Drive to Survive did amazingly well is to hook people with a very, very simple narrative. And it's the from rags to riches, zero to hero type of journey. And through that, people suddenly warm up to the other details and the complexities of the sport itself. So they suddenly have a reason to learn about something. And then Maybe, who knows, like a kid that uh, starts watching the show, maybe develops an interest in uh, aerodynamics and in 10 years is going to be an aerospace engineer. So, mm -hmm. yeah, that's... I love <laughs> it. It's a bit of a expansion of the butterfly effect. And I, I would say you, you pick Formula One, F1 as a, the ex an example, but one that kind of struck me recently, kind of the opposite flow from the US to, to Europe is MMA, right? The mixed yeah, martial arts which is uh, back in my time in, in the US, it was a little, it, it was a thing. Right? UFC has historically been big, but there was come a non-existent in France and Germany, Western Europe. And then recently there's been an explosion of that, right? And, and you would think this scatters to only a small audience, but you see families from kids to grandparents watching MMA fights, which is nonsensical when you think about this, right? It's just people just getting sweaty and beating the shit out of each other. And so, um, 
this is all story related. And I think those guys that are behind it and the promotional level of us are uh, absolute expert in communication. And 100%. we need to leverage, hire, get inspired by some of those guys to fix the climate story. Because as you say, it is at least as awesome as professional sports. Uh, way more awesome. <laughs> so we need to entertain. I think one way to do this is to entertain, to educate, um, to get away from the IPCC reports. What are the vehicles? What are the channels that we can use to entertain at the climate level? Yeah, I mean, literally any channel. I think like the reason why climate is so much more awesome than professional sports is you have magical things. You have technology that is indistinguishable from magic that for most people, when mm -hmm. they see it for the first time. So sure. let's start about like direct air capture, regardless whether you uh, think it's uh, commercially viable or not, just having a massive vacuum that sucks CO2 out of the air, compresses it, and then uses it as a ingredient for greenhouses to produce mm -hmm. bigger vegetable yields. I mean, what the hell? That's that's the topic. <laughs> <laughs> and if you if you look at literally any type of solution path within climates or climate tech, you come up with these technologies or just new service models that are mind blowing the first time you hear about them. And so I think that's coupled with the characters that are currently in the quote unquote arena. Very smart, very well-meaning people and so you've been longer in climate than i have but what i was blown away is to see that there are these people who've been working for 5 10 15 20 plus years in the industry even before it became a hot thing for vcs to invest in so meaning mm -hmm. even if there was no money people were dedicating their lives and their brains and literally everything to come up with these crazy solutions. So it's like really interesting characters, it's like the fringes. So it's like the actual freaks who on their weekends try to build these massive vacuums, even though there's like no uh, no money in it. So do they in blockchain and crypto, one could argue, right? And I would say that one of the moments, the, the, the aha moments or the explosion moments of crypto is the financierization of it, meaning that you can tag along and his network effect because the more people join that blockchain story or the Bitcoin story, the more it accrues value. And in a climate fight, we still paint it as too much of a doom and gloom. And there's a sort of the end of the world. That's the cliff. And that's it. And so a lot of people don't want to get a rally because they think this is just not inspiring. It's just, uh, t you know, taking off from their freedom and they see too much of the negative aspect of it. But I wanted to bounce back on one. Uh, so you say carbon capture, this kind of vacuum that sucks uh, CO2 out of the air. I would say also on the other side of the spectrum is uh, nuclear fusion. And mm -hmm. I, you have no idea how many people are gonna got blown away with this prospect of recreating the star and having unlimited free cheap energy. And uh, I'm going to give you a bit of an, an anecdote. You know, when you run a, as a VC, a deal, right? Typically you try to rally a syndicate. You as an investor start selling the, the, the startup to other investors because you've taken the lead and you're trying to gather a group of really smart investors around the table. It is really hard to sell insect farming, precision farming, a new uh, electrode for hydrogen production, but there's nothing simpler to sell than nuclear fusion to very educated and expert investors, but they have no clue whatsoever of the science. <laughs> yeah, everyone wants to play God, right? <laughs> Creating a right. sun is amazing. <laughs> and also because it sounds so far and so insane and so transformative that, yeah. you know, if it works out, which is the promise of VC, if you hit that super returner, you're, that's a total home run. But I'm always surprised how few of them really want to dig deep into the details of it. They just do not have time, but they actually don't care. They care about the story. So VCs are not immune to storytelling, all, all the contrary. I think storytelling is the driver of FOMO, and FOMO is the driver of the, of the universe in the whole venture capital world. So we need the stories. I just quickly wanted to go back to yeah. one of the questions that you asked previously. So you asked what type of medium, and you probably have different information consumption preferences than I do. I'm, mm -hmm. I don't know if you love long form writing as much as I do, or maybe you, you like it more, but maybe you're more of an uh, audio thinker, or maybe you like video. And so um, 
from a storytelling perspective, I think you can tackle all of those. Uh, of course, it's kind of be real with yourself and identify what your love language is or what your preferred medium is to talk to. I think video doesn't suit my skill set that well, but writing does. I'm a very slow thinker. And so if I can sit <laughs> for a week or for two weeks and write something, uh, it, it's going to be much better than if you ask me a question and I have to respond on the fly. I see. And I, I, it was one of my questions. So how did you find your voice along the way, right? When you found out that you were a, a good writer and you wanted to communicate things, uh, how many iterations or when did you opt it for a newsletter and that kind of format? Yeah. So writing, like thinking back has been with me for a while. So I even remember when there was MySpace, I had a small personal my space and writing just silly stories about my classmates. And uh, unfortunately, <laughs> that that MySpace doesn't exist anymore. But uh, in, in a more structured manner, we started with content marketing at my previous company, mainly because we had been uh, banned from Google mm -hmm. AdWords very quickly. So like within the first ad <laughs> campaign, they blocked us. And even though one of my co-founders was uh, one of the early employees at Google, just no way of uh, unblocking that. So someone told me it's a rite of passage uh, in ads tech to get your AdWords account blocked. Anyway, we, we, we had to pivot our, uh, our marketing strategy. And so we said content is you control it, it's inbound, and it's just a scalable asset either for internal documentation or for external documentation. So we became really serious about it. And uh, uh, I spent a lot of my time trying to figure out what the best format was. So we had like a weekly and biweekly type of situation where we would do one introduction articles about our technology, because I don't know like how long you want this uh, answer to be, but I'll, I'll, I'll do like the two, a two minute loop. One interesting thing about branding and technology markets is that it applies perfectly well for climate tech. So what does it mean? In technology markets where you come up with a solution that is novel, one of the main strategies is to educate the market about the problem before you present your solution. And uh, the interesting thing is if you come up with something that's completely new, you have the flexibility to create the category for that. When you come up with all this educational content for that particular category, you immediately and implicitly become the authority for that category. Do it long enough and people will be searching for the category. And then, hey, look, who came up with the category or who has the most content for it? It's your organization. So um, from that perspective, it's a really good time investment from my perspective, specifically in B2B markets to do content marketing written because it is indexable and uh, easily to search for. And so that's like why I love the written yeah. word so much. And and in the words of Kevin Kelly, you want to create your tribe of 1000 true fans and, and um, because of the growth engine behind Substack or Beehive or some of those newsletters, you can get there fairly quickly. I mean, if you That's do a true. good job repeatedly, it's all about consistency. It's all about consistency. And it is hard to believe, though, when you get started as a new content creator, you see your thing going one new you know, subscriber every week or two weeks, but it compounds. Yeah, one, one easy way to think about it, uh, even not as a creator, but also as an organization, is the question is like, why should I spend four hours, eight hours on one content piece if I could be doing daily business. Think about mm -hmm. it that way. You have certain questions that are asked all the time by your own employees and by people that you're selling to. And the easiest way to scale your time is to answer with a link so that you don't have to always respond with a phone call or just like a, uh, a meeting session where you're speaking to your employees. Write it down once and then just share the link. And that way it scales just like code content skills right no absolutely and one other way that you've kind of cracked this is using art or just a form of art using images uh you know that are quite quite attractive in this ethos of sexifying or gamifying making it more palpable for people using uh, art and not only art but a, a new form of art is gen ai and mm -hmm. yeah you're gonna speak to how you use it um how much time does it actually take to generate those images that are pretty cool on your newsletter and is it the future? So um, I am currently using Midjourney, 
which yeah. uh, for those who don't know, is a generative AI image creation tool that primarily is controlled via Discord. So you download a mid-journey bot, you have a simple command called slash imagine, and then you just write whatever you want it to generate. I'm currently experimenting with it within my writing process just to have a s- slightly different stimulus for the audience when they read the piece, because those pieces are usually 2,000, 3,000, 4,000 words long. And so if it's only text, might get a little bit boring. But if you have something mm-hmm. visual, it's almost like a lemon after like a shot of tequila just like to freshen things up and, and a little um, salt on the side <laughs> yeah exactly just like to, to have something new and um how am i creating those so when i write about the topic so the most recent one was called five minutes mba in energy policy and i was trying to think well okay like what's my first association with this topic title then i was thinking educational institutions i was thinking harvard I was thinking uh, maybe educational institution in the style of a classical painting. And one of the first things that popped up was a, uh, it looked almost like a Greek auditorium where a balding bearded man was talking and the light was shining from the sides. And uh, I I thought, perfect, that's good enough for me. Just rendered it and then Mm. used it as as my cover image. So I think for kind of nonfiction essays and analysis pieces. The cover art is mainly where I use generative AI for the other type of essays, which are fictional climate sci-fi short stories. I try to use the gen AI tool to illustrate the story. And the most recent one was a a collaboration with my friend, Mike Taylor, who is actually writing a book about Gen AI for O'Reilly Media. Mm. And uh, the, the, the story was called In Screens We Trust. So it is about the idea that everything that we do, even this conversation right now, I'm sitting in front of a computer, you show up on my screen, But whether you show up on my screen, I have no way of verifying if it's actually you. And with the capabilities of Gen AI, with your set of, let's say, uploaded podcasts, it could be totally possible that the version of you that I see in front of me is simulated. So this is what the story Uh was about. And uh, my friend Mike then was brainstorming kind of like what could uh, be a cinematic universe for that. He came up with a couple of prompts that uh, specified the mood and the particular area of the story, which is Texas, because the story is fundamentally about being constrained within your own four walls. But Texas is an area of freedom. So kind of having Mm. this juxtaposition of kind of like, what's the idea but like, what's the execution? So kind of like have this tension also in the artistic expression. Anyway, so it's a pretty cool tool. Is it a future? I don't know, but it's immensely fun to use. And uh, I've received a lot of positive response for these images so far. Yeah, it's definitely a differentiator. And it's good that you're getting praise from the, the general public. And you and I almost a year ago spoke about using generative art or AI to communicate new ideas, right? To inspire, and again, in these the, the the principle of entertaining or through a different lens and touching to a different audience. Uh, but one thing happened that kind of rendered this whole project obsolete. <laughs> what is this event? You tell me. Well, the, just the, the mainstreamification, I guess, of ChatGPT, and oh, yeah, that, yeah. that put a ton of spotlight on this whole space, and everyone kind of went ballistic. Midjourney and Dali, uh, kind of the two leaders in the, the image uh, on the, the, the photo and the image side, you know, got a, you know, used so often that no, it's not a differentiation. And it kind of goes to show the speed of how innovation goes, right? And I wonder whether we're going to see this kind of moment in climate. Often, case when people tell me, well, we've had clean tech, green tech, those waves that are kind of collapsed and never rendered any kind of serious exits. I take the opposite example where you have exponential tech or new waves that can completely change the face of the world in just a matter of a couple of months. Mm-hmm. And OpenAI, ChatGPT is one of them. I wonder whether climate tech will see that. And do you think we can crack this with a new form of message or narrative? Well, okay. So the, the question whether... The current uh, iteration of the the climate tech hype cycle versus the the green tech or clean tech hype cycles is legit. Mm, My answer would be, 
I don't think we need generative AI for that to be successful. It seems mm-hmm. like governments have woken up to the importance. There are a lot more subsidies. There are a lot more uh, regulatory actions that help the industry become more solid. And so it seems to go from the fringes into mainstream, which is good. Right. So specifically in the European Union, there's a bunch of legislation that mandates certain sustainability goals. And so I think uh, it, it, it arrived in the prime time. Does it still require a better narrative? 100 percent. Yes. Mainly for the reasons that I mentioned previously. I think the ceiling of how good the stories can be within the sector are so far above everything else in other industries. Wall Street, forget about it. If if Wall Street can get young folks excited to work uh, 80 hour weeks for crazy salaries in Manhattan, I'm sure climate tech can motivate people to seek purpose and actually work on unfucking the planet. So better narratives are 100% needed. Right. So the subject is there, right? We have the subject matter that should rally the masses. It's yet it still doesn't. There's two things missing, maybe the desire right? The carrot and then the tension, the, the stick somehow. So you've written about this as well as we basically could create three types of content in any kind of shape or form, video, audio, book, you name it. Mm-hmm. Subject is who are the courageous people, the stories working hard to save the planet. Yep. Number one is what are we fighting for? What lies on the other side of net zero? Meaning what kind of world do we aspire to build? Yep. Just that alone can keep us busy for decades. And then the tension is what are the obstacle, the stories of reinventing ourselves, our civilization, et cetera, et cetera, so that we deserve that fight to overcome them. So that loan kind of. Yeah, hundred percent. Just just to paraphrase, so like in the uh, and this is not something that, that I came up with. It's uh, from Bill Grundfest, who uh, is the creator of the Comedy Cellar in New York, and he's written many successful TV shows. And he said his sixty second MFA in uh, creative writing is the following formula: Who wants what, and what's in the way? And so if you break it down, who is the subject? Once what is the desire? That's what you mentioned is like what what lies on the other side of net zero and then what's in the way. That's pretty much the struggle and the tension that keeps people interested in following along. It's kind of like a puzzle, right? Like who you wants to solve this puzzle, that the puzzle, that's like what's on the other side and the the work, the intellectual curiosity that's needed to match making the different puzzle pieces is what keeps you at the table until you're finished. And so if there's like only one thing for people to take away from this conversation, I think it's all narrative follows a very, very similar structure. And it's like, who wants what and what's in the way? You as a climate organization, just try to think what's your very unique way of looking at what is lying on the other side of net zero. And uh, just to quote another creative Rick Rubin, one of the greatest uh, producers of all time, he said the act of creation and just like the artistic act is expressing a very unique or your unique view of the world. And if I'm looking at entrepreneurs, there's not that much different what you're trying to do with a new business. You are convinced that your particular solution solves one problem in a very unique way. And that means you're creative. So just follow a structure, tell the story, and get people excited about it. Yeah, and also gamifying this whole space. And you were writing about that. Could you tell us why climate tech is the greatest game of all? Yeah, I mean, it's like uh, games. uh, Also, just building on the shoulder of so many other writers that have (laughs) written about this topic. But um, you probably know it from your own experience. If you try to do something which is way too hard you'll probably give up pretty quickly if there's just like no possible it needs to be winnable it needs to be winnable you have to have hope but then if something is too easy it's also boring right so there's like this perfect space in between doable but still challenging enough and if you look at uh what a lot of climate tech companies are doing a lot of the stuff sounds extremely challenging so if you think about companies that are creating enzymes that eat plastic and break it down into their subcomponents like what the hell that's science fiction but it's still doable with 
basic biochemistry fundamentals. And so from my perspective, I think the argument is pretty good that the climate tech has a pretty interesting balance, especially if you're someone who is intellectually curious and if you're looking for interesting puzzles to solve. So Yeah. And, and, and you say your favorite games, right? If you kind of do the mental one minute think of what are the games that you're obsessed about, those are the games that you can share yep. or that are played with your friends. And this is when you have a great time together, you build new memories and you kind of want to challenge each other, et cetera, et cetera. How could we create that kind of gamified experience? Is it on the investment side? And this is something that I'm thinking a lot about is uh, we democratize it. We make it so, so accessible that anyone, your granny, your cousin, your ex could invest in the space. And then you kind of compare each other's kind of portfolio or you let them in to your deals. So is this of thinking too far? Or you're thinking more along the lines of the, you know, how to involve the masses in this great enterprise. Yeah, from the investor perspective, I cannot uh, speak too much. But if you're thinking just like from the builder perspective, journey groups are immensely helpful. So journey group can be like your schoolmates if you learn math like one plus one. Or your journey group can be if, uh, let's say, you are building a company that has something to do with the electricity grid and you are you have another buddy or someone that you just get to know who's also building a company, building for the grid, and you eventually learn about all the different electricity markets, all the regulations. It's struggle, but if you emerge on, on the other side of it, then you can say, whoa, we really marched through hell together. <laughs> and this is a memory that you'll keep forever. So I'm sure there are these struggles that different groups can do together. I think for uh, from the investment perspective, very similar. So like how do you identify the actual solutions that are maybe moving the needle the most? And if you find those together through information sharing, then probably you have like a similar type of coherent experience that you can say, oh yeah, we did this together and we figured it out. And it's funny, as we have this conversation, we realize that what's needed is actually not just a better engineering, better technical technicality or nerdy details. It's much more about how do we new narratives? How do we express and communicate them? How do we gamify? Does the game theory apply to this? It's a complete different set of skill set than people imagine. Right. So the yeah. self-limiting beliefs to people that are the best brains out there that feel excluded from this whole climate space because it feels too nerdy. We need everyone. I, I like one. I, I like to say compared to the climate opportunity, Amazon.com looks like a lemonade stand. And if you <laughs> think about it is if if we are really serious about achieving net zero by 2050, what we actually have to do that's the desire, is to substitute the entire GDP of the world. Think about that for a second. It's crazy. And so how can this be done? Either existing organizations, so the incumbents, change how they do things. So that's a massive opportunity for entrepreneurs or employees at companies such as Saudi Aramco, ExxonMobil, and so on. Or you're in the bucket of the pirates and the challengers and you say, well, if they're too slow, we might swoop in and come up with something new. Also a very exciting proposition. And to come up with a solution in the climate space, unless it's like a very, very niche let's say, software type of solution, usually involves so many different things. I, I wrote about it in, a, in an essay called The Gordian Knot of Climates. And if you think about kind of climate challenges, they have to check four boxes. So A, it has to be good on the climate and sustainability side. B, it has to be technologically feasible. And that usually means moving, manipulating bits and atoms. So also like real world and digital world. The third bucket is there are legal and regulatory complexities that need to be solved. And the fourth one is that it has to be commercially viable. And so this already tells you what type of different characters you need to involve. So maybe you need the climate scientists, the, the biologists to look at like your, your impacts of the solution. B, you need the engineers, whether it's software or hardware or mechanical engineers to actually build the solutions. You need a team that's interfacing with all the governmental aspects and legal aspects. And then at the at the end, you need someone to run the, the, the organization uh, <laughs> Ideally with a profit. Well, I just, um, I'm still sure actually, um, <laughs> it kind of hit me with that one. The fact that you need to subtract the entire GDP of the world. 
I like to think about it that way. It's a bit like I'm trying to find an analogy in the NBA world or football, for example, the European Champions League. And you say, all right, you have the Real Madrid, the Barcelona, some of the clubs that historically have dominated. But now we need to introduce new rules that are changing uh, football. And so those guys will need to reinvent themselves from, you know, entirely or, or disappear. And there will be new players coming up. And so obviously this is the biggest game of all time because you need to do it in a compressed way. All the existing players can take part, but they need to profoundly change them. And it incentivizes like crazy the new ones because the more profound the change and the more accelerated way it is, the more rewarded it gets, right? So 100%. Yeah, if, if I mean, uh, when, when I was younger... And when I just started dipping my toes in, in the in the startup space, one of the things you hear frequently or you also think about is, man, I wish I would have been around in the early 90s when domains like as a.com was right. available. Right. Right? <laughs> oh, my God. I would have been so great and so smart. But now reframe it where we're currently sitting. So net zero is 26 years and two and a half months away, 26 mm. years and two and a half months to change how the world economy works. What the hell? This is it is thousand scary. times greater than dot com in it's many ways. thousand times greater than it's literally the, the entire world economy. And regardless of where you're working, whether it's publishing, uh, artistry, industry, policy think about it like what what's the what's the current footprint scope one two three and what are the possible ways how this goal of net zero will impact your particular industry if you want to stay in that industry then that's like a question that you can start asking yourself and maybe you come up with something wow well i'm gonna ponder on this this is the monster carrot the biggest carrot in the universe <laughs> for anyone that wants to join in well thanks so much art um it was awesome conversation. Great that we touched on those very critical topics. Super insightful to follow your journey. Carry on. Thank you so much. And to all of you, as always, thanks for tuning in. Yeah.